Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Rennie Grills, and I work for Mewasin Valley Authority in Saskatoon. And uh, my job with Mewasin is the resource management officer, which means I'm Mewasin's land manager. So I look at, I'm responsible for about 17, 18,000 acres of land along the North, North South Saskatchewan River, about, uh, covering about 80 kilometers of River Valley, north and south of the city of Saskatoon. Uh, we cover a wide range of lands. Uh, have everything from sand dune complexes on the south side of the city when you go south of Saskatoon towards uh, uh, the casino, you get that sandy country there, and then north of the city you get more into sort of heavy clay loam sites. Uh, one of the challenges we have is actually a lot of our sites are being used by a lot of people, and so we're trying to manage land for wildlife conservation, biodiversity, but also providing that access to the public as well. So that creates its unique sets of challenges. Also within the River Valley, there's several islands that we manage as well, which are sort of forested islands that we, do, uh, that we work on. Uh, I want to acknowledge our financial support I, uh, for the, some of the work that we're doing for grassland bird enhancement and also invasive species control is from Environment Canada through the Habitat Stewardship Program. So they provide us a three-year grant to help manage Rewasson's conservation sites for grassland birds. And also, uh, the way New Austin is set up, there was a specific act that created New Austin in 1979. And within that act, we have three main participating parties that provide us with our core funding, uh, which is about half of our funds, and then the rest of the funding we fundraise for. Uh, the City of Saskatoon, the University of Saskatchewan, and the Government of Saskatchewan. So we actually manage land for those three participating parties as well, so as part of our mandate. So at New Walson, we take an integrated approach to our land management. So we use a suite of different activities to manage the land. And uh, we use everything from prescribed burning to grazing. Uh, we use the term targeted conservation grazing so because we're not managing, uh, we're not grazing specifically for economic purposes. We're grazing for a conservation objective and it's actually a very targeted approach and we'll talk more about that. We have a very aggressive invasive species program. We do some restoration projects, uh, site maintenance programs, so we look after the sites that we, look at, uh, that we have. We do monitoring, and then we also do a lot of awareness programs. Uh, one of the sites that we have, uh, Beaver Creek Conservation Area, is actually an interpretive center, uh, just south of the city of Saskatoon, where we bring grade five students from around the Saskatoon region to come and learn about nature and the outdoors. And also, I do a lot of extension outreach as well. So one of the sites I'm going to talk about today is uh, a site called the Northeast Swale. So the Northeast Swale starts in Saskatoon. If you're familiar with Saskatoon, uh, this is Central Avenue. So the old Sutherland, community of Sutherland. Uh, Cabela's is right about there, if you want to know where Cabela's is. And this is sort of on the edge of Saskatoon as the city's expanding out. Uh, it's a series of, it's an old post, it's, uh, the official term is post-glacial uh, channel scar of the South Saskatchewan River, which means it's an old river channel. And it, if it, and it flows about 26 kilometers north and east of Saskatoon, so it comes back into the river at uh, the Clark Rail Ferry Crossing between Mormon and Aberdeen. So that landscape is uh, an arrangement of uh, little hills, native uh, grasslands, and uh, a series of wetlands. And then it drains into the river in a couple of different spots. Most of the wetlands are fed by groundwater, but also surface drainage. And, uh, and it's been, uh, it's also uh, remnant patches of uh, plains rock fescue, which is now a rare grass in Saskatchewan. So if you go to the Coquille Valley, on some of the north facing slopes, you get some nice little prairie wool. That's where, you know, that's what plains rock fescue is. And so there's remnant patches within the swale. As part of that swale, there are several other uh, sites that we manage as well. One of the challenges that we have is the city is starting to grow up around the site and uh, we're trying to manage the site while urban expansion is occurring. So this is just an air photo from Google Earth from this year. So that's, uh, here's the river here. This is that Central Avenue. The city's putting, I don't know if you've heard about the new bridge going in at the north end of the city. So this is the new road that connects to the bridge, tying in the neighborhoods of Aspen Ridge 
a brand new neighborhood of Evergreen. So it's bordering right on the side of, uh, of this area. And so we have the challenge of trying to manage uh, that site with also about 15 to 50,000 people going to be moving into that area at the same time. On that site, we have a lot of records of uh, species at risk on that site. So uh, Shirley mentioned uh, uh, northern leopard frogs, that's what she was talking about. Uh, several of the wetlands there are home to northern leopard frogs. But we also have numerous grassland birds that find, the, uh, find that as home. Historically, we had burrowing owls up in the Saskatoon region. Uh, they haven't been seen since the late 80s, but uh, we do have records for that site for burrowing owl. And then several other species, for longer shrike, sprigs, pipit, short-eared owl, which is on this uh, trail camera photo we captured last January. It's hard to see in this, in this room, but it's, I had it confirmed by someone uh, with Environment Canada that it is a short-eared owl, which is a species of uh, special concern. Also, we have uh, uh, mammals uh, like local <coughs> bats on the site, and we also have several rare plants as well. So, as a land manager, my job is to try and manage this site for those species at risk. Uh, one of the unique things that we found on this site a couple of years ago was uh, we were finding lots of sharp tailed grouse on the site, which is the provincial bird of Saskatchewan. And we were finding lots of use, you know, so lots of scat, lots of birds. And we figured that there must have been a lek nearby. So last, two springs ago, we actually found the lek, and there's uh, 40 breeding males on this lek. So the lek is the, the dancing grounds of the sharp-tailed grouse. So the males sit in the, in the lek and dance around, and the females sit around and watch the males dancing. And uh, we counted 40 males, which is, makes them one of the largest leks in the province when we talk to the provincial biologists. And with this being within city limits, it was quite surprising. Also, this was uh, about half a mile or a quarter of a mile away from the old Saskatoon Wildlife Federation gun range, which there was constant shooting or blasting going on, and these birds managed to stick around with all that noise. So actually, this is a little video. We'll see if I can make it work. So you can see the birds. They stick their back tail up and their arms out or wings out, sorry, and then you can see the male sort of spinning around like a top. <laughs> yeah, so it's pretty fun to watch. Uh, we actually, when this, the, the first year we had our trail camera on, recorded some video, we threw it on our social media page, and the video went viral. Like, everyone was, thought it was pretty cool to see. And if you can hear closely, you can actually hear them sounding like little wind-up toys. They make an interesting sound. Not as impressive as it was sharp tail grouse in southern Saskatchewan, but still fun. Yep. Is it okay to interrupt? Yep, go ahead. Um, how many years have we had an active uh, We know, well, we discovered it three years ago. Um, have there been 40 birds every year? The last three years, 40 birds. Yeah. Yeah. However, um, it's, that area is not with it. It's outside of the zone that's protected for the swale. That area could potentially be developed in the future for housing. So, but there's a and there's a local advocacy group that's trying to protect that area for those birds. Uh, two other sites that we uh, have the grassland sites that we're doing um, work on is uh, Beaver Creek Conservation Area and Cranberry Flats Conservation Area south of Saskatoon. These are on uh, right along the river. They're also uh, sand dune complexes. So my predecessor, Luke, who had worked at Mewasset for 32 years, his job was to actually try and stabilize the sand dunes at Beaver Creek, because historically they were, uh, the dunes were shifting, there was no cover, and they were shifting everywhere. And so he worked really hard to try and get grass cover on them, which is the best management practice. However, uh, we have several species at risk that we're finding on these active sand dunes. So some rare plants, such as this uh, smooth goosefoot, requires that disturbance of that shifting sand dunes. And so we, uh, we that, and there was historic records that uh, Beaver Creek in this year, uh, Environment Canada went out and confirmed they were still there in some active sand dunes. And then uh, at our Cranberry Flats, we have some trails going down to the river where people are you know, causing erosion. And uh, we had someone out this year found this uh, tiger, uh, tiger beetle that uh, it's a, they're really colorful and this, the 
light in here doesn't really show the beautiful colors on that beetle. And they like those aquasandunes as well. So it, yeah, it's interesting, you know, we were trying to prevent erosion and trying to keep, you know, the ground stabilized, but yet we're potentially losing habitat for these species at risk. So each species requires different habitat conditions. And so, uh, you know, you know, we're, I'm a land manager, I'm not a rancher, I'm not a producer uh, in my daytime job, but, you know, trying to manage for these species at risk, you can sometimes have conflicting uh, requirements as well. So with uh, the grasslands, uh, grasslands evolved under our climate, under fires and under grazing. So this, that sequence of droughts and wet cycles and cold cycles and hot cycles, that influenced how our grasslands evolved over the last 10,000 years. Grazing historically was done with by bison, now with cattle. That infected the vegetation types. And some years they would go in and graze really heavy in one area and then not come back for, dead, or for years. Other areas they would repeatedly graze historically in terms of the bison. And then with fire too. So fire would occur sometimes once and then not occur for 25, 30 years. And sometimes sites would, would burn every two to three years. Sometimes caused by lightning, sometimes intentionally set or accidentally set. So that evolution of the climate and fire and grazing sort of influenced wildlife habitat, land management, and how you know, our prairie grasses evolved. So if you look at some of our grasses, like if you look at some of the taller grasses, tall grass prairie uh, plants, like that little blue stem we see in the Coppell Valley, that nice purple grass that was about this tall, really shows up in the fall. That was that evolved under a more frequent fire, and uh, you know about three to five year cycle, you know, which is a lot different than say you go into the southwest corner of the province where maybe their fires occurred every 15 to 25 years. So each grass species evolved to different uh, conditions. And so with that, you got different scales of patchiness that occurred on the landscape. Right? So you had uh, temporal or time uh, scales that were patchiness were occurring. So the, cat, the bison would come back every year or every five years or every 10 years. So that was a temporal scale. And then spatial scale, they would either graze one little area really hard every year, say maybe a creek site, and then they would leave the hilltops or and sometimes not go back and that would create sort of patchiness in the spatial scale. So as a land manager, I'm trying to create some of this patchiness and you know, so I can create sort of unique habitats for all the different species used, utilizing um, our sites. So this uh, uh, graph or chart shows sort of the impact different vegetation heights and different grazing patterns may have an effect on different grassland birds. So this is more found in southwest corner of Saskatchewan, not in this area. Some of these birds are found around here, uh, like uh, Sprague's Pippet and Bear's Squirrel you can find in this area, uh, Ferruginous Hawk as well. And each species requires different habitat cover types. So if you look at something like uh, uh, Baird's Sparrow, Sprague's Pippet, which are both uh, Sprague's pippets on the threatened list, right? So it's a threatened species. It requires sort of a combination of semi-short grass to mixed grass, but no reduced shrubbiness. Whereas something like a fruginous hawk likes more open cover for its hunting purposes, right? So that's another looking at scale or patchiness trying to create on that landscape. So this graph shows uh, Graphic shows for Sprague's pippet, which is a grassland bird, and it's threatened. And it's showing its habitat preference. So it likes large grassland blocks, about a hundred and a quarter section in size. <clears throat> it avoids trees and shrubs. It avoids tall grass, but it also avoids bare ground. So it likes sort of that medium, you know, moderately grazed pasture. They'll stay away from ditches and roads as well. So, you know, so that's sort of, for that species, that would, that's sort of the habitat conditions it's looking at. If we would take one of those other bird species, this you know this graphic will look totally different, right? So if you're trying to manage for a suite of species, you have to do different things that create different habitat patches. So one of the tools that we use at Mewasin is prescribed birding. Uh, who here uses fire like for burning stubble or for stubble or uh, flax stubble? Flax stubble. Whatever, yeah. yeah. Just get rid of crap. Just get rid of crap. Yeah, that's a good way to do that. Anyone else do any burning? Very minimal. Very minimal. Yes. Yeah. So the same, the same yeah. excess. Excess material. In the field. 
Yeah, in the field only. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, part of the challenge, and um, my family farms north of Humboldt, and we burn use fire, you know, for burning stubble, excess material as well, flax as well. Um, and then, but also as a land manager, we're using fire at Wawson. And part of that is to do two different things. One of it is to bring back some of that natural disturbance that occurred on the land. So, you know, have that cycle of burning and grazing. But also we're trying to actually control weeds with our, with our burning as well. So, in the, uh, or species that we're trying to knock back. So in this case, this is a patch of Kentucky bluegrass. And uh, there's rough fescue in that grass, but uh, it's become such a thick, dense, thatch material that uh, we're trying to expose it and open it up so that the fescue can come back and, and grow through. So that, in that case, that was the management objective of our bird. In this bottom corner here, uh, the management objective was trying to knock back the shrubs. Uh, one of the situations we have in the Saskatoon region was the last 10 years of really heavy moisture has seen a tremendous growth of that Kentucky bluegrass, so our native grasses are dropping. And then also we've seen a major increase in the shrubbiness on that landscape. So by trying to knock back the shrubs with the, you know, with the, gray, uh, with the burning, you know, we're trying to at least knock them back a little bit and uh, try to increase the habitat as well. How is the, how effective has the burning been with the Kentucky bluegrass control? Yeah, that, what, what we've been finding is, and, and actually it was interesting, I was in North Dakota in October for a conference as well, where they talked about grazing and burning and Kentucky bluegrass, and they're finding major issues as well with it, really increasing. And it's not just burning by itself, and it's not just grazing by itself. They were finding that that combination of the two tools was probably the most effective. So with Kentucky bluegrass, what it does is it creates, so you have your grass here that comes up, and then it dies back, and you got that thatch, right? And you can see it there. But below that thatch is even a heavier, thicker thatch. So if you run a fire through it, if you start looking within that green area where, you know, where the grass is coming up, there's still a thin micro thatch underneath. So depending on how you set your burn, if you do a nice hot burn with a slow creep, you might be able to burn that thatch layer. But uh, what you, your best bet might be to stick cattle in or sheep in afterwards and, and with hoof action break up that thatch. So it's using that combination. Also, when you get Kentucky bluegrass that thick, you know, that thick, cattle alone may not break up that thatch, right? Unless you really go with really heavy, intense stalking rates, right? So it may be a combination of the two tools, might be the best, depends on your operation. Right? In your case, you can't you can't graze that property. Uh, we are we are grazing, yeah. We're actually using sheep grazing. I've got okay. some pictures. Right. Yeah. However, I don't have cattle right now. Yeah. And different in yeah. 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 Right. yeah. So one of the things I do want to do is start raising cattle out there as well. But that poses its own challenges in an urban setting. Sheep yeah. are one thing that yeah. people don't get too worried if they see a sheep roaming down the street. But if you've got a uh, well, bossy wandering down, then they start asking questions, right? And so, but we are, I am uh, trying to put together some uh, uh, partnerships and some proposals to get some cattle grazing going. Because the sheep are really, and goats are really good at controlling those shrubs. But they're not the best at controlling that uh, Kentucky bluegrass. Yeah. Uh, also, in spatial patches, you can see we're, so quite often we'll do uh, burns in the winter time or early spring in March. We'll go in between those snow banks and burn. And so we've got natural fire guards. And then we go back later, and uh, when the snow melts, then burn out those areas where the, uh, where the snow is safe. So our risk is greatly reduced by doing that type of burning. But it also creates some of that patchiness on that landscape. And the top one is a picture of a Aspen stand that I burnt out. I'll tell a little bit more about that story later. And then I, I, and temporal patches of burning, so over different time periods. So the top uh, right left corner is uh, burn done first in March, so still on the ground, late in the season, early in the season. The green was actually burned that I haven't done, but it was done before for by my predecessor. He used to like burning in June. Go out, the Kentucky bluegrass was nice and green, and most and uh, you'd go in and burn that, it'd be easy to control because it was still green, but it would create lots of smoke, and the fire would slowly creep underneath and would burn out that thatch really well. And then uh, that one, the last photo, uh, the top corner of their photo was one that we did in November. November 
So what, this is a map of the burning that we've done at the swale since uh, for the last 10 years, showing the different patches of fire that have occurred on the landscape. So and and at different times. So that's showing some of that patchiness that we're trying to recreate on that landscape. In terms of the lek, the lek is found right about there. That's where the lek is found, just outside the boundary. So then grazing, so we have been using sheep and goats. Uh, this actually was uh, some sheep grazing we did this last fall. Uh, this is actually uh, browning the sheep, and she's uh, actually a hairless sheep. She's not your standard wool sheep. So it looks very close to a, uh, a goat, and it, I guess the, the lineage comes from uh, the Mediterranean, so I think that's why they look more goat-like. But looking at, uh, this was grazing in 2015. What we do is when we graze, we uh, put electric fencing up, net fencing, and set certain catch sizes and try and get some really high stop densities with sheep, and sometimes not as high density. So in this patch right here, that's about four acres, and we have 375 sheep in there. You can see all the little white dots in there. How long do they stay? Like Depending on if we meet our management objectives. So this is this year's grazing on one of the bridges. In this patch, my goal was to take out 80% of the grass, graze it right down. And so we had a really small patch with 285 animals and we graze it right down because we knew we weren't going to come back to that site for a couple of years, so we have lots of rest afterwards. I also want the sheep to try and break through that, uh, that crust layer of the Kentucky bluegrass. Eh, fair. Um, but also my primary objective was for them to nip away at the wolf willow. And the sheep just love the wolf willow. The producer we worked with, our regular producer wasn't available to work with us this year. So we brought a shepherd from uh, uh, East End, uh, Sue Mikulski. Yeah. Shirley and uh, Carolyn know Sue. And uh, she came up to work with us. So her sheep have never seen wolf willow. They came from the drought of the southwest this year, and they came up here. And we were worried that the sheep would touch the wolf willow. And so what we did was for the first two days, we had them sort of a bit of a quarantine in some pens. And we were feeding them wolf, uh, that wolf willow, clipping it off and throwing it in the pen. As soon as we let them out, they went straight to the wolf willow. So, uh, so they were nipping away at that. And, it, and we were grazing mid-August into mid-September, and the objective was to try and graze or browse that uh, wolf willow just as it's putting its roots back into the, into the ground. And they're, I'm sorry, not its roots, its nutrients into the roots for the winter. And so we'll see next year how effective that was. So we had sort of two objectives with that. And then also temporal patchiness. So 2015, uh, no, sorry, that was 2014, Jared on the horse. Uh, we were raising that in mid-June to mid-July. And then uh, this year we were doing mid-August uh, uh, mid to mid-September. And that's, you know, the can of thistles already gone to flower in that stage. But also trying to alternate grazing periods as well. Uh, one of my objectives, though, is to try and get some uh, work done and try and get some cattle grazing in there as well. What I would really like to do is try and graze cattle in sort of that mid-June into mid-July, graze off the Kentucky bluegrass, and then follow up with the sheep in sort of mid-August to mid-September, and so sort of then have them focus on the shrubs and sort of use that multi-species approach. Uh, I've had some discussions with uh, a couple different uh, Saskatchewan Stock Growers Association and a few other cattlemen groups to try and see if we can do a sort of a joint uh, trial and uh, the biggest challenge is trying to find funding. Uh, getting people to graze in the city, it's, it's not hard to find people that are willing to graze, it's the hard to get the insurance to do the grazing in city limits. So, sure. Do you have any idea what the comparison is like between the way sheep and goats graze and yep. the way pronghorn graze? Um, is there any attempt to yeah, I mean, reproduce that? Yeah, I'm not sure what the different, so in terms of browsing, so have a graph and some other presentations I give. So cattle, 90% of their diet is grass and a little bit of browse on flowers and shrubs. I think bison, it's 70% grass and then the rest browse. Sheep are about, you know, about a third grass, a third flowers, shrubs, and about a third browse, so shrubs. So, you know, a third of grass, a third of 
flowers, yeah, forbs, yeah, and then the third shrubs, and then goats, uh, they'll eat up to 90% shrubs, right? So that's the differences in their diet. And I think the pronghorn is sort of in between that sheep and that goat category. Also, cattle will like the lower slopes, you know, in the you know, round wetlands and lower areas, and the goats and the sheep will go up at the water higher elevations, and that's the differences in the breeds, right? So that's sort of the differences in those spatial grazing as well. So you can do the same thing with antelope and deer and uh, uh, buffalo, say, at grass at the National Park, or a bull on its back, right? They would be sort of that similar type of response. So we're trying to manipulate that with uh, livestock. So this is the grazing that we've done over the last uh, five years. Uh, we had a break in 2016 because our shepherd wasn't available. So that's showing the different patchiness as well. And then when you overlay the burning and the grazing, you start seeing some of those differences. And what we, we did some uh, monitoring work. And what we found, if our target was Kentucky bluegrass control and shrub control, that interaction of grazing and burning was the most effective in trying to knock back the Kentucky bluegrass and trying to knock back the shrubs. Uh, unfortunately, like this site here, you know, it's, I think if we would remove grazing and remove burning from that site, I think within 15 years it would be totally covered in shrubs and moving into an aspen stand. And we have another site nearby uh, located right about here called Sassan Natural Grasslands and that has turned into a shrub community because we haven't done any burning or grazing there in 15 years. So we get up into these parkland situations, you know, that grazing is quite critical to maintain those grasslands. So I'll shift into invasive species a little bit, so, uh, and a little bit more about birding. So with our invasive species program, we do a combination of different tools as well, and we use burning as a tool for weeds control. We do grazing, uh, we do a lot of hand pulling, especially on stuff that have tap roots that you can easily control with uh, hand pulling. It's also good uh, work with uh, summer students and volunteers. For some reason, volunteers like pulling weeds. I don't know why, but it's a great volunteer activity. And then we do biocontrol, so where we, uh, especially for leafy spurge, where we'll go out to uh, near Moose Jaw, the sand campground, they've been using uh, leaf, leafy spurge flea beetles for biocontrol in that uh, site for 25 years. And what the beetle does is it, uh, its larvae are, are, are laid in the, near the root of the plant, and when they, or the eggs are laid near the root, and then the larvae, when they emerge, they eat away at the root of the leafy spurge. And so that helps control leafy spurge. It's a very really long, long process for them to control a large patch of leafy spurge. Like you're looking at 20 to 25 years. But it is a, it's a control technique. Uh, we do some mechanical removal with mowing, and uh, especially if you're looking at shrubs or even some grassy, weedy areas. Uh, we do use herbicides, and uh, especially when I'm in the city and uh, Talking to people, I really want to emphasize that we do use herbicides. You know, it is one of the tools that we use for uh, invasive species control. And uh, some of these noxious weeds, we have to use um, herbicides because there's no way you can win that battle without that herbicides. But we all we have to use it in a safe manner, using following label, and we try and use it minimalistically as possible. And then also a lot of awareness about invasive species. So this is that swale site. This is the very west side of the swale. This is that Sassan Natural Grassland site that I mentioned. This is some university land. The yellow dots is, a, is an invasive species called common tansy. Is anyone familiar with that one? I know you are. <laughs> so common tansy looks, grows about this tall, has uh, a bunch of yellow flowers on top of a bunch of little button flowers. Uh, the leaves look almost fern-like, and when you rub the leaves, it has sort of a, a sage, not a, almost a sagey smell. And uh, it's becoming a real major problem up in, uh, you know, uh, if you get up into that Watrous country, Humboldt country, Tisdale, Malford, uh, up in the North Malford area as well. I know there's some parts in southeast part of the province as well are really having major problems with it. Part of the problem is it goes to seed. When flowers goes to seed, it stays standing tall. And the seed will stick around in the wintertime. So when it blows, it will blow across the snow. Also, if it's in road ditches, when the RM comes and mows their ditches in uh, October, great way to spread the seed. And I know back home that was the main source of its spread was the ditch mowing. Uh, absinthe, uh, I'm sure 
all seen that one? Yeah, it like, really likes disturbed areas, really has that strong sage smell, uh, produces, you know, bajillion seeds for plant, really tiny little seeds. Actually, fairly easy to control if you spray it with the right herbicide um, over a couple of years, but if you don't get on top of it, you can take on the whole area fairly quick. And then I mentioned leafy spurge as well. And actually what's interesting in the swale, we have a patch of leafy spurge at the very north end that we've been controlling with birding, uh, herbicide, and also bile control. We have it pretty much under control. But what's happening is we're starting to find little leafy spurge patches everywhere. So this map is uh, two years old. It's not even last year, it's not even, uh, it's 2016 map. So back then we knew there was a patch in this area here, a leafy spurge here, 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 here. However, this year I found more patches, one right there, th three patches along here, a patch over here, and about five patches in here. And I think what's happening is deer, there's a lot of deer in the area. We have uh, uh, mule deer and white-tailed deer, some really heavy, uh, large herds. And I think they're moving leafy spurge around within uh, that area. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about birding and leafy spurge. <laughs> So uh, some of the fire effects of invasive species. So quite often with uh, using burning to control invasives, or for controlling weeds is the timing. And a uh, different type of bird, different timing of bird has a different impact. And quite often it's in combination with other tools. So in terms of like uh, smooth grown grass, if you're trying to uh, protect that rough fescue grassland, that native grassland, smooth drones moving in, fire is an effective tool to remove it. But quite often, you either have to follow up with either a, a, a spray, a wicking of glyphosate or Roundup, or even grazing. Uh, other species like leafy spurge, actually, uh, this was a burn that was done in 2013 on a leafy spurge patch, done in mid-June, uh, mid so still nice and green, it's flowering. The intention there was to try and knock it back while it was flowering. However, what it did was it just made it angry. It, it just really stimulated the roots. So what, what, it, what it did though, was it stimulated the roots to pull more out of the roots and make that grant plant grow more aggressively. The next, unfortunately they, they waited two, a year and then they